I'm glad they brought some tissues up here for me. No, really, y'all, um, I'm going to really try not to get through this one um, without some tears, but making no promises. So, I'm going to just warn you. I'm going to tell you a story here at the end, and um, it's a hard story, so you have to have some tissues. But anyway, we have been talking this weekend about our walk, our walk through this life. We've been talking about what it looks like to have a beautiful gate, and we talked about last night the most important thing to have a beautiful gate like Jesus had is to know who you are. Who God is as a good father, know his heart towards you as not only an heir, but a personal daughter. And knowing who you are and who your father is will affect what you do and how you walk. And we talked this morning about having that knowing who you are determines how you walk. And we talked about how it's so important that we have a laser beam focused on the purpose of giving Jesus because when people meet Jesus, everything changes, right? That's what we talked about this morning. So now we're going to talk about the last part of Acts 3. I told you we're going right back to that same passage, Acts 3, 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles, open them up. If not, I think all the verses are on the screen now so you can look through them. I know this morning I only have part of their oh God, on there. So here we go. We're going to pick right up and jump right into the Word. We've got lots of good stuff to get through. I hope we can get through it all. If not, y'all are going to stay another night, right? Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day, remember, carriers carrying him there every day, to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter... He asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from him. <coughs> then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. <clears throat> this man went from having no gait, literally, could not walk to having a beautiful gait, wouldn't you say? Amen. He went from being on a mat, not able to get up and move off the mat for himself, to jumping up. And let's look at those verses, 8 through 10, one more time. I just want to, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God. I'm going to stick on those three words right there. He walked and praised God. What made this guy's gait so beautiful? Was it the fact that he got to stand up and walk? That's part of it. That's a pretty cool miracle that everybody got to see, right? That was a pretty cool thing. I mean, it says that people were filled with wonder and amazement when they saw his healing but that wasn't the only thing that amazed them and made them stand in awe and wonder. It was the fact that he walked and praised God. Put yourself in the place of the man on the mat. You just received ability to walk for the first time. I stand up off my mat for the first time and feel strength in my ankles and in my legs. I don't think my first thought would be to praise God. My first thought would be like, this dude, Peter, did you say your name was Peter? You just healed me. I'm praising Peter. I'm praising John. I'm running home to tell mom and dad, look what just happened. I can dance, right? I'm going to go tell those bullies that used to pick on me in school, look what I can do now. Take that. That's my first thought. Here's what happened. He was not as amazed by the healing in his legs as he was at the healing of his heart. Amen. He got a hold so of the healing that comes with knowing Jesus Christ. This man went from sitting on a mat outside the temple courts. He sat outside by that gate and he heard truth from the temple, but he was an outsider. 
He was an outsider stuck on a mat out there. He didn't get to go into the courts, into the temple, to have the party and the praise and breaking bread and, and, and to fellowship with other new believers and have that excitement. He was an outcast. He was a loser in the society. He sat out there, and when Peter and John turned, and they said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. He was healed for the first time, and he felt the touch of a good father who singled him out of the whole world, out of every soul on this planet. He was singled out by his good father for the first time, and he Amen. felt, I matter. I count. That God that I've heard about for years knows me, knows who I am. And he did not think about praising Peter for his healing. It did not cross his mind to run home and tell mom and dad. He went with them into the temple courts, walking, jumping, and praising God. And that is a beautiful gate. Amen. When we get a grasp of our true healing, we can walk with our beautiful gate. And what does that look like? looks like praising God. You say, Angie, yeah, it sounds really good. If I got healed from a, a, a terrible illness or a sickness or lameness or blindness, I would praise God. It's easy to praise God after the desired healing has come. After we've been praying for something for a long time and God meets specifically what we've been praying for. Woo, isn't that fun and easy to praise God? Well, you think that would be fun and easy. But think about that story in the New Testament about the ten lepers. Y'all remember this story? So Jesus is with his disciples, and they're walking to Jerusalem. It says they're outside of Galilee, and they're walking, and they hear this yelling from afar. And they look over, and there's ten men with leprosy. And they're yelling out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And so Jesus looks at them, and he yells back, Go show yourselves to the priests. All ten... Turn, walk, and it says, the word says, as they go, they are healed. One man, when he realizes he was healed, turns, seeks after Jesus, and it says he is praising God in a loud voice. He finally gets to Jesus, and he falls at his feet, and he thanks Jesus. Now, it is very important to see that he was praising God with a loud voice. He falls at his feet and he thanks Jesus. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Hey, weren't there ten of you? Where are the other nine? Weren't all ten of you healed? And only one has come back to give thanks? Jesus takes him by the hand and says, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Some translations say, Has made you complete. Has made you whole. I have to believe that all ten... The other nine, they were grateful. I am sure they were grateful because now they went from being outcasts to being able to go back into society with their families. I'm sure they were all grateful. But do you know there's a difference between great, being grateful and praising God? Mm -hmm. There is a difference. I think a lot of us, we're, we're grateful. But do we praise God for our healing in a loud voice? I um, was reading through the book of Job. This is another example. I'm just going to go through it real quickly. No, I'm going to actually wait and go through that in a minute because that ties into our next point as well. It fits in both, but here's the deal. It's, we say it's easy to come back and praise God after desired healing has come. But it's very important that we move past the point of just being grateful to praising God out loud. Why? Because that's what makes our gate look like Jesus. That's what makes our gate beautiful. It's not an inward, hidden gratitude. It is an outward expression of what he has done Amen. and our true healing. So when we talk about healing in this message, let's define healing. It's not necessarily a healing from a physical issue. It might be. But it's any situation that we're in where we see God show up. That's healing. Amen. And so... Let's talk about I'm going to give you guys an example. So we look at this man in, um, in Acts 3 and how it says in that last verse that when everybody saw him stand and walk and praise God, they were filled with wonder and amazement. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, and we would too. But let me give you some um, illustrations that aren't quite as elaborate. You may not be able to relate to that a miraculous healing, but you can probably relate to um, some healing that I have just experienced on a different scale. And this is when we receive... Um, we are able to praise God before 
a healing comes. This is harder. Praising God before a healing comes. And, and so I'm just going to bring this down to real life a little bit. Like, are they not that God providing or doing great miracles is not real life, but I'm talking about like everyday instances. So this was just a few months back. I was, um, it was a Tuesday, and I remember it's a Tuesday because Tuesdays and Thursdays, I've got about four hours with no kids. All four of my kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays go to some sort of school or preschool for a few hours. And so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have a little bit of alone time to get stuff done. And so I put off things until Tuesday or Thursday that have to be done. And so this was a Tuesday morning, and I had a ton of stuff to do that I needed concentration and quiet and a computer to do. And so I had bills to pay online, right, because that's how we do it now. So I had to pay all my bills. I had to um, write my message and email my notes and stuff for my upcoming lesson that I was about to teach to our student ministry. And I just had this whole list of things, and I needed to do it on my computer. So I walk into the, the ta I go to the table where my computer is, and I open it up, and I push the button, and I hear the hard drive making all that, <laughs> like it's working. But nothing ever comes up on my screen. And then I looked real close, and I could see just very faintly, that it was on, but the backlight had gone out in my computer. And this was not a good day for this. <laughs> Crazy Mama was already knocking. She was already on the verge, and so I said, okay. So I pushed the button again, and I shut her down. And I waited a few minutes. I counted to 10, calmly, not just for the computer, but for Crazy Mama to get back inside. And I pushed the button again. <laughs> Heard all the noises going on. Again, nothing comes up. I grab my cell phone. I text my husband, who's at work. <sighs> my computer just died. The backlight went out, and I put one of those emoji cons. Y'all have those that went like this. <laughs> so he knew I was serious. And he responds back, praise God. I know, right? Who does that? I looked at my phone and checked the name up at the top to make sure I was sending this to the right person. Just kidding, babe. But seriously. So then, <laughs> praise God. And if you guys know my husband, and some of you do, you know he has a tendency to be slightly sarcastic. And so I couldn't really tell. There was no emojicon to tell me how he was feeling when he said this. Praise, praise God. So I replied, question mark, question mark, question mark. And he replied back, well, babe, I don't know what else to tell you to do. God has always been faithful in the past, and I have no reason to believe that he will not be faithful now. So let's praise God. Wow. I know. I shut my computer, and I did not obey. <laughs> I did not. I thought to myself, this is not a praise God moment. There are lots of praise God moments. And I give him credit for all of those, or most of them, or some of them at least. But this is obviously not one of those times where I should be praising God, because he lost his mind. So I shut my computer that wasn't working, and I walk into my laundry room, and I start folding clothes, because I can't do anything I had planned to do, so I might as well do something else. So I'm folding clothes, and it's just I can't get rid of that. I wasn't mad. I wasn't upset. And crazy mama was long gone, because he spoke truth. And that made me think about it, but I still wasn't to the point of receiving that. <laughs> And so I just, you know, went on about my day. Next day, I get up, get the kids off to school. I still have my two little ones running around, and I look over and I see that computer sitting on that table. And I go and I just open it up, and I push the button, and all the gears start working, and the light comes on. Now, I didn't praise God, but my husband did. And I don't know, but I just had to believe that, huh, Maybe there's something to this praising God before the healing comes thing, but I don't know. I'm telling you, this is not an exaggeration. That very weekend, we're talking a couple of days later, I'm in the kitchen cleaning up after dinner. Justin's in the bath in the, our bathroom helping the little boys get ready for bed, bathing them. And so my brother-in-law, who's living with us at the time, comes in from the garage and says, Angie, where's Justin? I was like, uh-oh. Well, he's helping the boys get ready for bed. What's going on? Your garage door just like completely broken. It's about to fall on your car, and I can't fix it by myself. Where's Justin? Ooh. I went to like 
crazy mom is starting to come out again. What do you mean? What do you mean? So I don't go get Justin like he asked me to. I go to the garage, see if I can fix this thing. <laughs> no, I don't. I, but I do go to the garage and I open up the door and I look and I see a disaster. The garage door, like literally half of it, all the little wheels had come off the tracky thingy and they had fallen down and all the wires had come unspooled and they were hanging. I didn't know a garage door had all these parts. I had no clue till they all became exposed at one time and it was hanging just about this far above my car and I was like, oh my goodness. Okay, I can't do anything about this. I'm gonna go and get Justin like Evan told me to in the first place. When God Justin said, Justin, I will take over this. You go help your brother fix that garage door. Justin goes out there and I'm in there the whole time getting those kids clean. Why do things break that shouldn't break? I mean, you push the button, it opens. You push the button, it closes. This is something that should just work. The computer should just work. My garage door should just work. These things should not be able to just break like that and with no notice. I mean, they should at least start getting slow, right? Start slowing down or pausing or give me some sort of warning that you're about to go out. Nope. Nope. So I'm sitting there just ranting and raving and the kids are like, what is she talking about? I think crazy mom is out. <laughs> so I get them ready for bed and I get them tucked in and then I go check and see if there's anything I can do in the garage. By this time Evan had left because he was running late to somewhere he had to be. So Justin was out there by himself and he's trying to put wheels back in tracks and stuff. And here's the other thing, if you know my husband, you know that he is not exactly what you might call a handyman. <laughs> in fact, we have learned not to shop at Ikea because when we bring things home to assemble, they usually get put together backwards and upside down and he's not one to follow directions. And anyway, so for him to be out there messing with all this, I just shook my head. Okay, Justin. And so I go out there trying to be a supportive wife and say, okay, what can I do? Kids are in bed, what can I do to help? He's like, well, maybe if you move the ladder over here and so I'm doing that but the whole time. Why does this stuff happen? I can't believe this stuff happens. And he's like, hey, I really feel like we just need to praise God. Again with the praise God. This is not, let's have a little class here, babe. This is not a praise God situation. Let's make this clear. We've got praise God situations. This is not one of them. And so he says, why don't you just go inside, take a little break, and you just put your feet up. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know what you're doing. And you're right. My attitude's not helping anything out here. And so what he does when he starts doing anything that he doesn't necessarily love to do, like mow the grass or fix things or whatever, he puts on headphones and he starts just listening to music and it helps distract him from whatever he's doing. So in this one particular instant, he went and got his headphones because he looked at this and said, this might be a while. He put on his headphones and he'd been listening to this album. If any of y'all have ever heard of Dustin Kendrew, he's got an album called The Water and the Blood. And, oh, it is, he sings truth like you wouldn't believe so. Anyway, Justin had been listening to this album. I hadn't started listening to it yet, obviously. And uh, so uh, I didn't learn all of this. I'll tell you that part in just a second. So all I know is he's out there trying to fix this garage door. I start to go inside my house and I take one last look back from my utility room that you know the garage door leads into. And I, I look back at this thing. And I just kind of shake my head and I don't say anything out loud because I don't want to discourage my husband who's got this praise God attitude. And, and so I um, just say, oh, I mean, like the steel tracks were bent, ladies. <laughs> they were bent. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not being funny. Like they were bent. He had gotten the garage door closed at one point and it was level for half of it. And then the other half of the garage door was four <laughs> inches or so off the ground. Like the garage door had been twisted and the fact that one side was going but the other one wasn't. It, the garage door had been twisted. It was bent, the steel was bent. And I looked at that and said, this is beyond repair. This cannot be fixed. This is not a situation, but that's okay. God bless my husband that he is in a good space with you and that he is, that he is spending time with you. And I just pray that you bless that time and, and tomorrow he'll come to his senses and we'll call a repairman <laughs> to come out here and fix this. So I go and I start getting ready for bed and I'm flossing my teeth and all this stuff and about 30 minutes go by and my husband comes in with these huge childlike eyes like Christmas morning. I mean huge eyes and he looks at me and I was like, uh oh. He's like, I fixed it. <laughs> no you did it. <laughs> That's what good supportive wives do, right? <laughs> he said, no, really, I think I did. I said, no you did it. I said, well, come on. So I said, okay. So we walk out to the garage. He opens the door and I look. The garage door is closed and it is perfectly level across the ground. There's no wires hanging down. The steel frames, tracks, were perfectly in line. 
I said, baby, I know you were strong. I did not know you could bend steel. He said, I did it. And so I said, okay, well, let's see this. He goes, are you ready? And I said, uh-huh. And he goes, oh. <laughs> and he pushed the button like butter. <laughs> that garage door opened so smooth. And I said, do it again. <laughs> than it ever worked. And I said, do it again. <laughs> do it again. Uh, no, no, I don't want to press my luck anymore. And I looked at him and I said, you did it. He said, I know. I said, how'd you do that? He said, I don't know. <laughs> we shut the door. We walked into the kitchen and both of us just started crying. Listen, I said, no, really, you were there. You were the one actually doing things. He said, here's the deal, you do. I don't know what I did. He said, all I know is I've been listening to that album. And he said, there's one phrase in the first song, and it says, there is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. He said, I just kept saying that over and over again. And I would just look over and I'd say, okay, well, I see that this is supposed to go there, and I would wedge that in there, and I'd do that, and then I would see that this is not looking right, so I'd go over there and recoil this, and, and I would look, and I'd push the button, and it would all fall apart again, and said, there's blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand in base. He said, I really felt like I was just there with God, and we were just working on it together, and I was just saying, there is blessing in the battle, and I'm going to take heart and stand in the base, and he just kept working and kept working until he pushed that button, and Babe, praising God in not praising God situations is amazing. He said, I know. He said, here's the thing. Here's what I figured that he learned. There's a verse in Romans, Romans 4, 17. We have this up here. I want you to look at this. It says, to the God who brings dead things to life, or your version may say, speaks life into dead things and calls things that are not as though they were. My husband had realized and understood this part of his good father that I had not grasped yet. That our father is a God who brings dead things to life and speaks things that are not as though they were. Everyday things like a computer and a garage door. Not just a man with uh, lameness who can't walk. Not just a deaf with, who cannot hear. Not just a broken marriage. He brings dead things to life yeah. and speaks things that are not as though they were. Justin grasped that and he claimed those promises and he believed there is blessing in the battle. It may not be fun and it may not be easy, but if I'm walking with my father, I can praise God before the healing comes. Amen. I learned a lesson also from that same situation. I did learn that one that he had already learned ahead of me. I don't like to admit that I'm very competitive. <laughs> the second thing that I learned also comes from Romans, Romans 8, 28. You've probably heard this in a variety of settings, but I just it really applied to me and hit me here. And there's three <coughs> words that stood out to me. And we know that in all things. Look at those three words. And we know that in all things. God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. In all things, in not praise God situations, he works that ugly, mean thing that we hate and despise and that should just work and should not stop working without any sort of warning. He works all those things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Guess what? I love him. And I'm called according to his purpose. He works all things for my good. Things I don't like. Things that he did not create and cause and plan, but that are in my life anyway. He works those things for my good. I have to believe that. I do believe that. Do you believe that? You have little cards on your table that have those two verses, and I printed those out for you because those two verses have really changed my life. And I'm telling you, this has just been over the last couple of months. This is not... This is brand new revelation to me that I am sharing with you, so please don't Amen. feel like I've got this all together, but I printed it out to you because I wanted you to have those verses and to see them. And when you see there is a place in your life where you have not received healing, praise 
God. Praise God. Don't just be inwardly grateful and say, okay, God, well, I thank you for this that might happen or this that. Praise God for the situation. Job, this is where I was going to go because it really fits with this point too. Job, you guys know it's a very popular story. Job, in the matter of like five minutes, realized he had lost everything except his wife and a few friends. He lost all of his wealth, his livestock, his kids, his own children. He lost everything. And while one servant escaped to tell him the terrible news, while that servant was reporting, another servant came in and told him more bad news. And then another servant, in a matter of just a few minutes, he realized that everything had been taken from him. And I want to read Job's response. Y'all, those of you that know the story, we know the end of the story for Job. That ultimately God restores everything he had in abundance. And then he ends up having more wealth and more kids and more children. And he's raised to a higher level than he was before. But before that happens, before any healing came, this is what Job said. Job 1, this is the very end of the first chapter. So Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my, father, from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Now, if he stopped right there, we say, okay, he was grateful. He really was grateful for what the Lord had given. So much that he was even grateful when it was gone. But this next line blows my mind. He says, may the name of the Lord be praised. He wasn't just grateful. He actively praised God. God in the middle of a very not praise God situation that in the world would look at and say, why would you praise God? It doesn't make sense. But Job grasped this concept of praising God before healing comes because he knew who he was and who his father was. He knew he was a beloved son and that God in all things works for the good of those who love him. There's a God who brings dead things to life and speaks things that are not as though they were. And Job knew that, he got that, he grasped that, and he was sad, and he was in agony, and he felt every emotion. It's not that you repress those and pretend like they don't exist because they do and they are real. And you still feel them and you can still walk in them, and that is okay. But we praise God knowing who he is and who you are and what he can do. There is healing, and that's the third point, that we can praise God for a better healing. I think a lot of times we are praying for a specific answer to a prayer. We are praying for a specific healing in some area in our life. And that's the only answer that we're looking for. And then well after God has provided another healing, then maybe we can look back and say, oh, you knew what you had me that whole time. And actually what you did was way better than what I was even asking for. But if we can grasp in the meantime that that is coming, that healing is coming, and it may not be exactly what we're asking for and how we're asking because we have a God who knows above, he knows the best solution. When we can maybe only see this, what we feel is the best, he has a God solution because he sees the big picture. God has a better healing for you than we have for ourselves. Ephesians 3.20, the God who, let's quote it. Let me find it. pages. There we go. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. He can do more than we ask and imagine. We're asking for the healing we think we need. He's going to give us the healing we do need. I've got a story that I want to share with you. When I was 21, I was able to... Um, go uh, do mission work for a summer. And uh, I only had, I, was, I had just, um, was just about to graduate. I had one semester of college left, just student teaching. That's all I had left to do. So I had a summer coming up before I could do my student teaching. And I thought, well, I don't want to just sit at home and hang out. I want to do something. So I applied for a North American local missions position. And my parents actually knew a pastor in a very small church, who had been a pastor in a small church in Missouri, and we'd heard through the grapevine that they were looking for someone to come work with in their student ministry. I thought, well, that's perfect. I love students. I was one not long ago. I'm just going to, I'll go out to 
who knows where, you know, when you're 21, you can do anything, right? And so I was able to go, and God made this great assignment for me to go to the small, small, small country church in the middle of, it's Norburn, Missouri, out in the middle of nowhere, literally, but there were about 20 to 25 students that came to this little country, white building church. It's like Little House on the Prairie. It's exactly what it looked like. But about 20 to 25 students that came every week. And my job was going to get to just hang out with them and teach them about Jesus. So fun. And so, I here's the plan. I was 21, and like I said, I had to make this trek from my house, and I was at my parents. So I was up here in Casper visiting um, before my assignment started in Northern Missouri and this other family that was remembers at this little country church where I was going to go they were actually doing something having vacation visiting family or somewhere at a midpoint somewhere between Casper Wyoming and where they were in Missouri I can't tell you where that is but back then I, they drew me a little map and I met them there and they thought it's best if we meet here in the middle and then you just follow us back to Norman because there's lots of back roads and I don't know if my dad told them, it's you need to let her follow you because she will get lost. <laughs> and I would have. So anyway, they decided to meet me halfway. I thought, well, that's awesome. I'll go ahead and get to meet a family from the church. So I meet them in this little midway town. And as I pull into this motel, they're staying in a motel. And it's one of those that you've probably seen and maybe stayed at. And it's got the, the, the doors on the bottom row that all face the parking lot. And then there's the second level and all the doors to the rooms face the parking lot. So that's kind of the situation. And I pull into the parking lot and I see this family and they're loading stuff up into their van. And so I think, oh, that's probably them. There's not many people there. And so I pull up and I get out and I said, hey. And they were like, hey, are you Auntie? Yeah. So we do the intros. We do some small talk and this mom and dad. And they say, hey, our son is here. His name is Rob, and he's 17, and he's one of the students that you're going to be working with this summer. And I thought, awesome. They said, hey, we want you to meet him. And so they yell up, and I see one of the doors on the top level is open. And so they yell up, Rob, Angie's here. And so I see this, this figure coming out, and uh, before I know it, I see a, a high school guy walking, and I think, oh, that's so funny. He's wearing a Halloween mask, a Halloween costume to, like, you know, gag is new youth worker and so I'm kind of laughing I look over at his parents and they're not making any sort of expression <laughs> oh maybe they knew he was up to this and so he starts walking and he goes to the stairwell and he goes down the stairs and as he's coming closer I realize he's not wearing a Halloween mask he's not wearing a costume and so as soon as that, that like dawn that's dawning on me he says Angie and he comes up and he gives me this big hug and I'm like, oh, hey, all right, how's it going? And he's like, hey, my name is Rob. And, and so we talk a little bit, and then we get in the car. And he says, hey, is it okay if I ride with you, and we'll follow my parents up ahead, and uh, that way we can just talk, and I want to hear about you and what you do. And so I said, hey, that's great. Rob, I'd love for you to ride with me. So we get in my car, and his family is in the, in the van in front of us, and we start making our way to Norburn, Missouri. And so while we're there, he's asking me all kinds of questions. Well, what do you do? Where do you go to school? What do you, you know? And he finds out all the stuff about me, and so I'm talking, and then we have this little awkward silence, and he goes, so do you want to hear my story? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, really. He goes, um, I know that it's kind of a shock when people see me. He's like, so uh, do you want to hear my story? And I said, well, we're not. If you want to tell me, then yeah, I'd love to hear it. And I said, but only if you want to. He said, no, I look for opportunities to tell my story. I would love to tell you. I said, well, then yeah, tell me. So he tells me, he said, when I was four years old, he said, I was, um, I lived in this trailer house out in the woods, like in the forest. He said, I can't tell you exactly, I couldn't even get you back to where it was, but I do remember I lived in the trailer house in the woods with my mom and dad and my baby sister. He goes, I don't remember how old she was at the time. She's a toddler, just barely walking between one and two. He said, and so we lived out there, and we had some neighbors that were a little ways away. And he said, my parents were addicted to drugs and alcohol. And he said, and at the time, I didn't really get that, but I did know that every night there was lots of screaming and lots of fighting, and, and they would, for, for, would forget to feed us and take care of us. And he said, so every night, we just knew, I grabbed my baby sister, and we'd go into our room, and we'd shut the door, and we would just stay there. And we would, he said, we would just play together and we would just hang out until the yelling stopped. And then after the yelling stopped and everything was quiet for a while, he goes, I would open the door and I would go into the kitchen and I would just go through the trash and try to find any sort of food that I could find, any scraps, anything to feed myself and feed my baby sister. Because my parents would forget to feed us. He said, and if I couldn't find anything there, my parents would be passed out. I would go to a neighbor's house that was a little ways away, and I would go through their trash in their yard and their dumpsters, and I would try to find food, and I would bring it out to feed my baby sister. 
he said, and this was just life. At four years old, this was his life. And um, he didn't know any better. This was life. So he was feeding his baby sister. And so one night, he and his sister, the parents came home, and they were yelling, throwing a fit. He did what they always did. He got his sister, and they went to the room and shut the door. And the yelling got really, really bad. He said, this one night, it was terrible. Like, it was really bad. And he said it was different than it had been. And all of a sudden, the yelling from my mom stopped. He said, she got real quiet, and I could hear my dad stomping around. He said, then I heard the front door slam, and things were really quiet. He said, so we sat there for a, real, for a long time. And then it was quiet for so long, he thought, okay, this is my chance. So he opened up the door, and he went to head towards the garbage. And as he was getting close to the trash can, he heard that front door swing open again. And he ran back into his room, shut his door, grabbed his baby sister, hid underneath their bed. And so as Rob and his baby sister are hiding under the bed, they lay there for a little while, and all of a sudden they hear his bedroom door open up, and Dad starts stomping around. All of a sudden he just remembers this terrible smell, this really strong smell that gets hard to breathe. And the next thing he knows, they're engulfed in flames. Father poured gasoline all over their house, lit a match. Rob grabbed his baby sister and tried to get out of that house. He finally got out. By the time the ambulances got there, Rob had been 80% covered in severe burns. 80% of his body completely melted and burnt. His baby sister did not make it. By the time he was 17 years old, he had had over 40 surgeries just trying to reconstruct his face, his arms, the wounds, and so he's telling me this in the car, and I am bawling. I'm like, I'm trying to drive, and I'm wiping tears. And I said, Rob, I am so sorry that that happened to you. I am so sorry that you had to go through that. He said, no, 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 Angie, don't be sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for me. He said, you know what, I spent a long time being sorry for myself. A whole, he said, a long time I asked God, why? Why did you have to take my baby sister? Why do I have to look like this? Why can't I go anywhere without children being afraid of me? Why do I have to live like this? Why did you give me those parents? Why? He said, and every day I would be so angry, and every time I looked in the mirror, I would just be so mad. He said, I would just ask him over and over again, why, why, why? He said, one day God answered me. He said, as plain as day, God said, Rob, everyone has scarves. Everyone has scarves. You get to wear yours on the outside. Most people wear their scars on the inside, where they can hide them, where they can bury them, where they can cover them up with all kinds of other things, where they can try to put on a mask so that no one can see, but they are bleeding inside. They don't deal, most of those people don't come to me so I can heal them because they've gotten so good at covering up. You have had to look at your scars day after day and you brought them to me over and over and over again. I have healing for you. You wear your scars and you wear them proudly because I have a better healing for you and I have a purpose for you. Your purpose, Rob, is to find people who will reveal their wounds and scars to you and you take them to Jesus. You show them how to take their wounds and their scars and their hurts and their bleeding areas in their life and take them to the healer. That is your purpose. So any chance you get to tell your story, you tell them what happened to you and then you tell them what I've done for you and what I can do for them. 17 years old, he's telling me this. This guy walked with the most beautiful gait I think I have ever seen. Let me show you a picture of my friend Rob. This is Rob, we have a bowling, Here's a, there's one more. That's me at 21, with Rob. This was the most joyous guy I had ever met. He had foster parents that he lived with and he worked really hard on their farm. He was up before the sun came up, he worked and he did all the farm chores by himself. His foster parents also took care of a bunch of other special needs kids. He worked and whistled and jumped and praised God. And he, I've never seen so, somebody work so hard and be so in love with Jesus and on fire and full of joy and praise God ever. And at 17 years old, he looked for every opportunity he could to help people find their scars and wounds and bring them to the healer. He did not get the healing that he asked for over and over and over again. He got much better healing. 
better healing than we could ever ask or imagine for ourselves. Your circumstances may not change. Do you believe that we have a God who brings dead things to life and speaks things that are not as though they were? <coughs> do you believe, even if your circumstances do not change, that in all things God works for the good of you because he loves you and you are called according to his purpose? Believe God is who he is and he can do what he can do and he wants to do what he can do in our hearts and in our lives. We can walk in a posture of praise. And when we walk in a posture of praise to the right person, our heavenly father, then we walk with a beautiful gait like Jesus did. Jesus lived a hard life. On this earth. Those three years of ministry were difficult. He was constantly persecuted, constantly ridiculed, constantly trying to be tricked and entrapped by the Pharisees. He was rejected by his own. He lived a hard life and constantly praised the Father, even to death, death on the cross. Walking with a posture of praise is how we walk in our healing. After a healing comes, before the healing comes for a better healing that we haven't seen yet. God, help us to receive. Receive the truth that you are the God who can speak life into things that appear dead. You are the God who can speak life into relationships that seem hopeless, that seem unfixable. Beyond repair, you are the God who brings those things back to life. There is nothing beyond repair for you. Nothing is out of your reach. Help us to believe that. We believe, but help us to believe when we start to doubt. When we don't see it, when it doesn't make sense. When the world says that we're crazy for praising God in a not praise God situation, may we be like Job and so many other examples and praise you before the healing comes so that you can, not just so that you get the glory, but yes, so that you get the glory so that we can have a good father walking with us through it. We don't have to do this on our own. May we believe that you work in all things for our good. God, I pray you help us to believe. Remind us of that truth that we can act like we got a daddy who loves us, calls us daughters. May we walk with a beautiful gate as your son Jesus did in a posture of praise to the Father. Love you. Love you. You are holy, holy, holy. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is our good Father. Whew. In the name of Jesus, amen. We have some time to discuss at your table.